Hello, everyone. My name is Chloe Korova, publisher of LGNSQ, the Logan Square book. And today I'm going to be talking about vernacular architecture, the people's architecture. This is the introduction to the built environment chapter and it was written by Logan Square resident Elizabeth Blasius. While many know of the Willis Tower and the Roby House, rarely does this architecture touch us in a personal way despite its iconic status. And rarer still is it accessible to those of different socioeconomic statuses. She's talking about poor people. Logan Square is famous for its tree-lined boulevards full of architect-designed late 19th and 20th century single-family residences, which are the foundation of Logan Square Boulevard's historic district. But it but it is the vernacular architecture of Logan Square that truly speaks to and for the community. After the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, the area that would become Logan Square appealed to people looking for affordable frame houses outside of the city limits and strict fire codes. As annexation came to the neighborhood and the elevated train arrived, it's the CTA. Immigrants from Poland, Russia, Scandinavia, and Germany established a welcoming community on their own terms in Logan Square, constructing worker cottages, two flats, and graystones, and filling courtyard apartments with their traditions. We'll pause for a second and take a look at some of these images. The photographer is David Shaliol, and just move this down. Ta da! <laughs> so, David Chaliel is a photographer. Um, this is my view from my hairdresser's chair at Twisted Scissors. Um, this is on Armitage, Armitage and Point Street. I just love how it's just so asymmetrical. <laughs> And I don't quite understand it, but it's there. <laughs> I look at it for hours each month. Mm. So the immigrants, these immigrants over the past hundred, hundreds of years, hundred years, designed structures that reference the architectural styles of their homelands. Uh, for example, the spire of the Mina Kirk in Norwegian Lutheran Church references steeples found throughout Scandinavia. And this pattern would be repeated in the mid and late 20th century as immigrants from Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Mexico settled in Logan Square, many living besides the ethnic groups that helped establish the community before. Let's look at a couple more images. Picture where this is. I think this is in um, Milwaukee Avenue. But there's so many, you think about it, there's so many um, commercial thoroughfares that you know, we find these types of structures. This one too, I like this one because it is just so stark. It's just whitewashed. Yeah, now it's like hipsters will paint the entire facade in like some other, you know, a neutral color, like gray, even black. Um, anyway, but yeah, we find these all over the neighborhood. And this. You could tell it's on Diversity Avenue. So this is a church. Yeah, and it probably was something before, but I guess this is an example, right? These um, uh, arches, it's like almost like Gothic arch, arches, very much European inspired. But then we have all these layers, right? Of other architectural details. Okay. And then we have this, this dental, motif. <laughs> it's just such a mis mishmash. You know, but you feel the history. It doesn't need to make sense. It's just layers of history. And you find this in Chicago. You find this in Chicago. You find this in mixed income and working class communities in Chicago. You don't find it in the suburbs as much. You don't find it in upscale neighborhoods where they raise this and, you know, put, um, some mixed use commercial development <laughs> luxury condos. Let's keep reading. Vernacular architecture bears witness to this cultural change. 
In the present moment that is Logan Square, it isn't the stately homes on Logan Boulevard that are threatened with demolition as these structures are, provide, are protected via the Chicago Landmarks Ordinance. But it is this everyday architecture of the people. Worker cottages, once a staple of affordability, are being replaced with new construction, commanding rents that wildly surpass the prices of the viable older structures. Vintage commercial buildings along diversity and California avenues, which have long been home to mom and pop shops are also being raised leaving us with edifices that are only affordable to tenants with corporate capital. Talking about monoculture. This loss of structures of our everyday lives quiets our conversation with the past and causes a shift from rich pluralism to capitalist monotony. The loss of people's architecture, the people's architecture, vernacular architecture, is a physical manifestation in brick and mortar of a greater cultural loss, meaning that we participate less and less in past narratives until they are rendered silent. So that was written by Elizabeth Blazes, Logan Square resident. Photographer for all these images is David Shalio. Let me show you some more. Oh. This is a garage. I forget where this is. Maybe um, it's not far from um, Sacramento, I believe, or the California Blue Line Station. I like to walk through um, alleys, especially around the first of the month. You know, I like to see what people throw out. And I, don't know, I just think it's really interesting. You see, you never know what you'll find in the alleys. Um, <laughs> so imagine you're walking through an alley. And you're walking through a Chicago alley in wintertime, and then you stumble on this, and then it's like, oh, it's like you're transported away to some verdant paradise. <laughs> I love it. But this, this owner, if you are the owner, please reach out to me. I love this stuff. But there are a number of garage doors that are um, decorated this way. And it's just such a gift to the community. Let me show you some more images, guys. Oh, this is on Lindale Street. Yeah, and so this building, Matt Bergstrom knows the history of this building. He's a resident of Lindale and um, also a member of Logan Square Preservation. He's very active in, in researching the history of buildings. The history of a lot of these structures go back over 100 years, but it's really cool just to see it's like you know this building is still being used and I think that's so important for preservation one way to just you know keep the the history of these buildings alive is to just continue using them for something so I'm not quite sure I think that on this build on this building maybe it was an art gallery or something but it was some sort of mixed use so Matt Bergstrom just ask him <laughs> please leave a comment Matt Bergstrom if you watch this video this is the photo from the book. I don't want to spend too much time on this one. If you own the book, yeah, this is on the back cover. This is um, just north of um, Milwaukee Avenue, west of um, Western Avenue. But um, I love it. I mean, you could tell this was done at a time. These were built at a time when, you know, people were building structures really fast in the city. And, you know, maybe it was to um, meet the demand of the influx of immigrants. And they were just, just, you know, stamping out these structures here. But I love that. It's like, yeah, it's like, you know, it's like the, the, the facades are painted. It almost kind of reminds me of, um, if you've ever been to San Francisco and the, the painted ladies there. Now here is a building on Armitage. This is Table Donkey Stick. And this little guy is just wedged between these newer condominium structures. And um, I love this because there's just this tension, right, between old and new. And these, this is one of the buildings that part, they're part of a series that I call Throwing Shade, where it's like, wow, we're creating these canyons, creating these canyons in neighborhoods with this new construction. And this new construction is shutting out the sun, throwing shade on the existing structures. It is, it is a sort of like physical man manifestation of trying to shut out the past. David is known for his night. 
his night photography. There's something about it, it's just very dramatic. And this is the um, Logan Crossing building. And look at that, it's just uniformity. I mean, some people love this style. It does feel a little bit like capitalist monopoly. And then you see this building, but there's also a lot of like very regular, you can say like, you know, there's monopoly on a smaller scale. So I don't know, old, new, um, yeah, there is tension. There is tension because now it's like where previous structures, you know, there was, they were built at a more human scale. Now we have like these, these, these buildings that are, you know, I mean, for some people, you know, it does feel, it does feel very cavernous. And, but for some people they're like, hey, you know what? They've been waiting a long time. They've been waiting a long time for this development. They've been waiting a long time for this. And they feel like this is a sign of progress. So I just find it really interesting. Let's take a moment, look at this. People have a lot of mixed emotions around it. And I've been a Logan Square resident for over 20 years now. And I, yeah, new, new development does, I do get excited. It's like, well, who's gonna move in? What stores are we gonna get? But at the same time, it's yeah, does this mean, does this come at a cost of displacement? Um, not quite sure where this building is, but yeah, I mean, you could see the sort of echoes of some of this like, European um, motif with, um, you know, this, um, you know, we have all of these uh, details here um, in the cornice. And um, not quite sure if that's, um, oh, yeah, we have four mailboxes here. This is a multi unit dwelling. Okay. I love these older buildings. They do feel very accessible. And oh, look at this twins. <laughs> I gotta maximize this. I love these frame houses. I love these frame houses. These are all over Logan Square. I just love them. Yeah, I do. Here's another image. That's, this is one of David's favorites. So we have little frame house between these two big houses and then the CTA. CTA going through the backyard. You got a CTA going through your backyard. Okay. <laughs> I won't see again, guys, sorry. Vernacular architecture. You know, when I was walking around the neighbor before I made this book, I didn't know that this stuff had a name. And when I read Elizabeth's, when I read her built environment introduction, it's like, I did start looking at the neighborhood differently. And I went to my daughter, I was like, hey, that's vernacular architecture. That's the people's architecture. These are buildings that were, you know, they were put up over a hundred years ago. They're still here. They're kept in use. This must have been um, some sort of corner shop, right? And um, yeah, just like different groups of immigrants have made use of these uh, structures, have occupied these structures. And they made changes to the building, made them their own. Let me end with this building. Oh, I want to end with this building. Let me get this guy back. Come on. <laughs> this is the Christmas house, guys. The Christmas house. Ta-da! So if you're a Logan Square resident with kids, or maybe you don't have kids, um, this is just part of your tradition. So this is on Logan Boulevard and the family that occupied this house for many years, um, they would decorate the house with, with hundreds, maybe even thousands of Christmas lights. And um, the displays would change regularly, maybe not every year, but it was just, absolutely magical. And there's so many people in the neighborhood who, you know what, maybe it was just a hassle for them or, or they couldn't afford to take the entire family downtown to see the, the Christmas lights there, but they can get that same magical experience right here in Logan Square. So we were very fortunate that, um, that while we were making this book and um, 
you know, the uh, owner of the property, um, he had died while we were making this book. So uh, we don't know the fate of the Christmas house is um, um, to be decided. We will, we will find out. We will find out what the, the new owners have in mind. So thank you all for your time. Thank you for listening to me read Elizabeth's, Elizabeth Blasius' um, piece on vernacular architecture. I do hope that you check out more of her work because she is a beautiful, beautiful writer. And I also hope you check out David Shalley. Go to his website, David Shalliel, because he has a very, very impressive body of work. He's traveled all the world, all over the world, documenting these changes in cities in the built environment and our urban landscape. And he will show you places, he will take you to, to places that I'm pretty sure you have never been. So I hope you get to know these, you know, this wonderful writer and this great photographer, and I'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>